We've given an overview of field theory. So now we build up from the foundations. The first main idea is the field as a vector space. That means we'll be using techniques from linear algebra. Now, what follows, F, K, and L will always denote fields. Definition, K is called an extension of F. F is a subfield of K. Now, you know, all we're doing here is switching the language. So the idea behind an extension is just, we're gonna build out from an old field to get a new field. So usually we do that by adjoining elements. Now, for examples, if K has characteristic zero, then K is an extension of the rationals. If K has characteristic P, K is an extension of Z mod P. Now, if we have this situation, that turns out that K is always gonna be a vector space over F. Now, if K is gonna be a vector space, that means we're treating these field elements as vectors. So to be vectors, what do we need? If we take any two vectors, add them together, we get another vector. So close under addition. And if we take a vector, multiply by a scalar, we get another vector. So close under scalar multiplication. Then we'd have to verify the other axioms for a vector space but they all hold up here. Now, one thing to note that's not typical for a vector space, in this case, our field of scalars actually lives inside the vector space. So here, F sits inside of K as the span of the element one. Now, we have vector spaces, so we could talk about dimensions. So definition, the degree of K over F is just the dimension of K over F as a vector space. Then we denote that in brackets like this with K before F. Now, if the degree is a finite number, then we say we have a finite extension. In this case, if we want to compute the degree, all I need to do, we look for a basis of K over F and then count the number of elements. Now note what this means Okay, if we have a basis alpha one through alpha n for k, I can write any alpha in k uniquely as a linear combination of the alpha i's with coefficients in R f. So all the c's are in f. For examples, okay, these are all over the rationals. Where q would join square root of two, degree over the rationals is two. We have basis one square root of two. Likewise, for q adjoin cube root of two, degree over the rationals is equal to three, with basis one, cube root of two, cube root of two squared. For an example with a complex number, let's try Q adjoin omega, where omega is the cube root of unity given by minus a half plus square root of three over two i. So this will be e to the two pi over three times i. Now, the basis here is given by one omega, so the degree over the rationals is equal to two. Now how do we see that? Well, we have that omega cubed is equal to one and omega is not equal to one. So we could divide omega cubed minus one by omega minus one to get omega squared plus omega plus one equals zero or omega squared equals minus omega minus one. So for any linear combination in powers of omega over the rationals, we could always reduce it down to a plus b omega so one omega gives a basis. For finite fields, if I have Q prime equal to P of the M, Q equal to P of the N, okay, P is a prime, and we also have M dividing N, then the degree of FQ over FQ prime is equal to N over M. We get that by counting. Now, theorem, so this is gonna give us a way of computing with degrees K is a finite extension of F, L is a finite extension of K, then L is a finite extension of F. And we have the formula, okay, degree of L over F equals degree of L over K times degree of K over F. Now for this, we just choose bases, count, check and make sure we have a new basis. So if I have a basis for K over F given by alphas, basis for L over K given by betas, I'm gonna to wanna to show that the alpha times betas give a basis for L over F. Three things we wanna show. First, that the alpha betas form a spanning set for L over F. 
then that the alpha betas are linearly independent over f. Finally, the degree formula. First, the spanning set property. So we'll suppose we have gamma and L. I want to show that I can write gamma as a linear combination in the alpha betas with coefficients in F. Now, because the betas form a basis for L over K, I can write gamma as a linear combination of the betas, coefficients in K, say alpha sub i primes. In turn, because the alphas form a basis for K over F, you can write each alpha sub i prime as a linear combination of the alphas where the coefficients are in F, so say C's. Now we put these together, we have gamma written as a double sum, so the coefficients are going to be C sub i j, and then what remains are going to be our alpha betas. So that shows that we can write every gamma as a linear combination of alpha betas over F. So that's our spanning set property. For linearly independence, what do we want to show here? Well, if I take any linear combination in the alpha betas, coefficients in F, if I set that equal to zero, then all the coefficients must be equal to zero. Now, we set our equation up like this, and we're just going to work backwards. So what we'll do first is to move the parentheses to the Cij alpha j's. Then I have a linear combination in the betas with coefficients in k. Because the betas form a basis, that means each of these linear combinations in the alphas are going to have to be equal to zero. Now, focusing on each of these equations, because the alphas form a basis for k over f, they're linearly independent, so each of these c sub i j's must be equal to zero. And that's the result we're looking for. I want all the c i j's equal to zero. So that means the alpha betas are linearly independent over f, as promised. We put these two together. That means the alpha betas are a basis for l over f. For the degree formula, we just count. Now, for the degree of L over K, okay, we count the number of betas and we get an N. For the degree of K over F, we count the number of alphas, we get M. Then the degree of L over F is the number of alpha betas. So M times N, and that's our formula. An immediate corollary, okay, so if we have, can we call this a field tower? So the L extends K, K extends F. These are all finite extensions. Then I'll have that K over F, the degree, divides the degree of L over F. So for an application of this, if I had, say, degree of L over the rationals or degree of L over Z mod P, a prime, then there are no proper subfields of L. So the only subfields are the base field, the rationals or the Z mod P, and L itself. For examples of this, okay, we've seen Q adjoined square root of two, okay, this is degree two over the rationals. We have Q adjoined cube root of two, degree three, and Q adjoined omega, degree two. For finite fields, okay, we have F sub Q, Q equal to P of the R with both P and R prime. Then I have degree of F sub Q over Z mod P equals R. And examples of this that we've seen are F sub four and F sub eight. So finite fields with four or eight elements. Another corollary. First, let's suppose K extends F. Alpha is any element in K. We consider the small subfield generated by F and alpha in K. So here we're just taking all finite applications of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, using only alpha and elements of F. So we denote this by F and we put alpha in parentheses. Corollary, if the degree of k over f is p, a prime, but choose any alpha in k that's not in f, then the subfield generated by f and alpha is equal to k. We'll see next time when I have a finite extension that the subfield will be equal to f adjoin alpha. Now, this follows from the previous corollary, so let's look at an example. So I'll take q adjoined square root of 2, what the corollary says. If we replace the square root of 2 with any other element of q adjoined square root of 2 that's not a rational number, we get the same thing back. So this is equal to q adjoined 1 plus square root of 2 is equal to q adjoined 2 thirds plus a 7th square root of 2, and so on. Of course, 
If I took Q adjoint two thirds, we're just going to get Q itself back. Now, another application of the theorem, okay, along similar lines. Let's suppose we have field towers as so. So L extends K1 extends F. L extends K2 also extending F. Leave it to you to show that K1 intersect K2 is a subfield of L extending F also. Now, because of that, if we have that degree of K1 over F and the degree of K2 over F are coprime, so no common factors, the K1 intersect K2 is equal to F itself. We could use this to be precise about how we adjoin elements. So, example, let's consider L equal to the rationals adjoin K cuber to 2 and omega, omega as before. We have intermediate fields K1 and K2. So we have the rationals adjoin Q root of 2, rationals adjoin omega, and then these have degrees 3 and 2, which are coprime. So we take the intersection of K1 and K2, we get the rationals. Now that means omega is not an element of K1, so we can adjoin it. If we compare the degree here, okay, well the only possibilities are 1 or 2. Because omega is not in K1, that means the degree is equal to 2. Then using our degree formula, we must have that degree of K1 adjoint omega over Q is equal to six. We set up our field towers as so. We'll label degrees for adjacent fields, and we note we already have an explanation for the lower part. So how about the upper part? We explain things in terms of bases. Now, L has degree six over Q, so for a basis we can use, we have one Q root of two, Q root of two squared, omega, omega Q root of two, and omega Q root of two squared. We have six elements in here, the degree is equal to six. Now for L over Q adjoint Q root of two, okay, this is equal to two, for a basis I can use one and omega, and then the coefficients here are gonna be in Q adjoint Q root of two. Likewise, for L over Q adjoint omega, the degree here is three. Base is gonna be one, Q root of two, Q root of two squared, with coefficients in Q adjoin omega. So here we have degree equal to three.